if you would add the family of Doug Haynes uh, to your prayer list. <laughs> Didn't you say that Nancy's surgery was tomorrow? It's been postponed. It was postponed? Yeah. Okay. I, I was going to say, I, I started to call her this week and uh, keep her in your prayers. Are there other prayer additions that, that I have not been in? Yes, ma'am. Cammy Lamonte. I think that maybe we have devoured and discarded you in our lives and in our world. It seems like all the turmoil that we experience is, is your absence, but we know you're there. Again, help us to understand your timing. Help us to understand that we need to continue to pray to you and ask for your guidance and your help. May everything that we say and do be in accordance with your word. And may we do all to glorify you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. If you want to.
to turn to number 17. Now, we don't have any music, which is just fine, because if I decide to start a song lower, I can. Okay? If I decide to start, I have Tony every one day. Is there any songs that you don't know? Oh, yeah, Tony, there are quite a few. But <laughs> number 17. We'll sing all three stanzas of this, John. Come, thou fount of every blessing, to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon.
I was surfing through the internet like we probably all do every day. I found it something interesting to me that shortly after the pandemic, the new trend had started. And folks started baking homemade bread more. Now this was an old trend for me because many of you probably remember as well. My mom used to make homemade bread every, every couple of days or so until we were teenagers and then she entered the workforce back in the later 70s. So if I wasn't hungry when she started baking, I, I sure was when that, when that break came out. <laughs> anyway, it started as a way to pass time while being isolated from one another and the hobby became a worldwide phenomenon. Stores experienced shortages of baking, pans, equipment, and supplies due to the demand. Google reported how to make bread without yeast became a popular search topic. While the reasons behind the baking cra craze may have varied from person to person, many social scientists pointed to the desire to find familiarity in the midst of change and uncertainty. Bread is comfort food for many people and it has been a staple of life for thousands of years. When Jesus and his followers gathered together to share the Last Supper, they were tired, anxious, weary, and afraid. But they definitely needed some comfort food. In Matthew 26, 26, 28, says, while they were eating, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. And he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, <clears throat> saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus knew his disciples were weary and overwhelmed. He needed, knew they needed to understand for all time the significance of the meal and everything it represented for a new covenant of grace and forgiveness. He also knew that at that very moment, they also needed comfort. So when we take communion as believers, we remember and celebrate what the bread and cup symbolize, the free gift of God's grace and forgiveness. These days, we can also use some comfort as we navigate a world that is different from the first century, but has just as much uncertainty. So as we prepare to take these emblems, Lord, please let us remember you have forgiven and redeemed us for eternity and that you deeply care and love us right now. May your presence and grace give us rest and comfort for today and hope for tomorrow. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I love you guys very much. And each and every one of you are very precious. To God, first and foremost, and to me. And it is a privilege to serve you. Um, you guys are more than just people. You're friends. Uh, you're brothers and sisters in Christ. And I want to thank all those who serve behind the scenes. Uh, thank y'all for doing that. Because uh, the church could not function without each one of you serving behind the scenes the way that you do. So thank you all for doing that. <clears throat> um, let's begin this morning with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that you are holy. And you are faithful and righteous and true and good. Thank you that you love us. 
and that you hate sin. And Lord, thank you for your son Jesus. And through him and by his blood, we can be forgiven of our sins and have eternal life to become a part of your family. Lord, I pray for those that are in Christ and that are being led by your Holy Spirit, that they will continue to be led by your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray for those that are outside of Christ, that today might be the day that they give their life, God, to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've been doing a series through Christ-centered self-esteem, and uh, we are going to do the last one in that message next week, um, but there's something that we need to speak about this morning that fits within it, but it's not actually in the book, and it's something that I've been hearing for a long time, and to be honest with you, I'm, I believe it's the Holy Spirit inside of me that's grieved each time that I hear it. So uh, we're going to talk about that topic today. So the title of the message today is... Are you still just a sinner? Are you still just a sinner? Now, this is extremely important because this affects where you spend eternity. I have a riddle for you, and it's not a hard riddle, but that's what we're going to start with this morning. <clears throat> okay, it's a riddle. At the end, tell me what it is. It got Satan thrown out of heaven. It destroyed fellowship between man and God. It creates separation. It creates, it creates strife in relationships. It calls man to fall. It's the source of all excuses. It's why serpents crawl on their bellies today. It got Adam and Eve thrown out of the Garden of Eden. It caused physical death to enter this world. It made work much more difficult. It made childbearing much more painful. It caused all of creation to be under a curse, even till this day, and even till Jesus returns. It was the source of Cain offering an inferior offering to God. It was the source of Cain's hatred and eventually him killing his brother. It is the reason that God decided to destroy the entire world by a flood, except for Noah and his family. It's the reason people tried to build the Tower of Babel, to try to reach God. It's why we all speak different languages today. It got Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed with fire from heaven. It is the source of strife among all the peoples of the earth. It's what caused Joseph's brothers to hate him and to sell him into slavery. It's what led Potiphar's wife to try to tempt Joseph and lie about him and get him thrown into prison. It has caused genocide on numerous occasions, including in our own time frame. It was the source of people's complaining in the desert. It kept Moses out of the promised land. It's why an entire generation died out in the wilderness. It is the source of idolatry. It is the source of using God's name in vain. It is the source of not honoring our father and our mother. It is the source of hatred, murder, adultery, envy, and theft. It is what could keep you out of heaven if you remain in it and do not repent of it. What is it? It's sin. 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 What is sin? Let's look at what, what is sin. This morning we must begin with a definition of what is sin. According to Vine's Dictionary, which defines the Greek words, and by the way, everybody needs a Bible that's as accurate and as close to the original Greek as possible. Okay? New American Standard's really good. King James gets it right most of the time. Um, there are other. ESV, I think, is pretty good. But anyway, you need and, and compare. Compare them. Okay? Compare them. Okay? So, sin is sin is missing the mark. It is disobeying and rebelling against God it, and the standard that God has established in His Word. Sin is lawlessness. Sin is rebellion against God and His Word. It, it is true that Romans, uh, Romans 3.23 says this, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's also true that Paul points out earlier in that passage in Romans 3, 11 and 12, compared to God, there is no one that is righteous. There is no righteous person, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. They have all turned aside together. They have become corrupt. There is no one who does good. There is not even one. It is true that there is only one who is completely sinless. 
our Lord Jesus Christ, in 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 22, referring to Jesus, he committed no sin, and no, he committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. Now, I'm going to go off topic here just for a second because I think this is important. Okay. Many teach, by the way, okay, the scriptures are inspired as long as you have an accurate translation. Now, even that's becoming more difficult in today's day and time frame because they just keep changing the translations to water them down to mean something different. But as long as you've got an accurate translation, that's inspired by God. However, the commentary notes in your Bibles are not inspired by God. You are going to get the theology of whoever that writer was. Okay? So, it's very popular. Uh, you know, I'll say, you'll, say, well, you'll see it today as far as the translations being changed. Now they're removing gender. Now they're removing different things. Okay, the NIV is usually pretty close with about two or three exceptions. And one of them we'll be speaking of today. Okay? Did you know that the term sin nature is not in the original Greek? It's not there. It's not there. Okay? And yet that becomes so dominant, right? There's a concept out there that uh, we all were born into original sin. Okay? That when we're born, we're just born into sin. That's not true. Well, it is true that all have sinned and fallen short of the will of God. That, that's true. We are given free choice to decide. Okay? If it were true that we were all born into sin, okay, if that were the case, then why did Jesus say become like little children? He wouldn't say become like little sinners, would he? No. But what else? When, when, now here's the thing, think about this. It does, sin nature is not mentioned in the original Greek. It says flesh. So we're either living by the Spirit of God or we're living by the flesh. That's the difference. Okay? So now here's the question. Was Jesus born into sin? No. Jesus was sinless. But was Jesus born into the flesh? Yes, he was. He became flesh it, you know, so that he could be the sacrifice for us. But he was not going to sin. In fact, he did not take on our sins at his birth. When did he take on our sins? At the cross. That's when the Father had it. it his, his relationship with God the Father would have been offered from the very beginning had he been born into sin. He wasn't. He was sinless. It was at the cross where the Father looked and he had all the sins of the world upon him. All of our sins, all the sins of those that ever committed on him at the cross. And that's when the Father turned away. So we are not born into sin. We are given <coughs> free will to choose. To choose to live by his Holy Spirit or to live by the flesh. Not the sin nature. Now, if you use the term sin nature, what's that, what's that sound like? And even theologians have excuses. Okay? Even theologians have excuses. If you say sin nature, what does that mean? That means, oh, it's just going to happen. No, it's not. It's not going to happen. We have free choice. Okay? We have free choice. Now, I believe the scriptures teach us clearly, as soon as we are truly old enough to know that we have sinned and understand enough of the word of God to come to faith in Christ, to know that we need to repent of our sins and to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, <clears throat> to me, all through the scriptures, that is the age in which people become accountable for their sins and when they have a clear choice to make. If they're so little, they don't understand God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, sin. You know, I don't believe that God holds them accountable for that. If you look at the scriptures, every person that made a decision, they were old enough to understand that they had sinned. And they were old enough to understand that they needed a Savior. Every, every person in the scripture was old enough to understand those things. Now, <clears throat> notice what John the Immerser, the one who was sent to prepare the way for the Lord, says of our Lord Jesus. The next day, it says, he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John 1, 29. Now, the second thing we'll look at is how serious does God take our sins? How serious? Because we'll tell you something. Beware of a man who makes light of his sin. Any man. Any woman. Beware of any person that makes light of their sin. Because God does not take our sins lightly. Okay? Now, um, how serious is God take our sins? The, the one question is worth, it's worth a multitude of sermons, truly, okay? So, however, turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 18, or you can follow on the screen, I do believe, okay? But Matthew chapter 18, and it says, uh, now I want to tell you right up front, some of this is graphic, okay? However, it is straight out of the scriptures, 
Okay? So, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel. And we're going to pick up in verse 4. The Lord God speaking, he says, this is the Lord God speaking, for every living soul belongs to me. God the Father saying, every living soul belongs to me. Father as well as Son. Both alike belong to me. Now notice this next part. The soul who sins is the soul who will die. And now he's going to give us some explanation of this. Okay? So, verse 5. Suppose there is a righteous man who does what is just and what is right. He does not eat at the mountain shrines or look at idols at the house of Israel. He does not defile his neighbor's wife or lie with the woman on her period. He does not oppress anyone, but returns what he took and pledged from alone. He does not commit robbery, but gives his food to the hungry and provides clothing to the naked. He does not lend at usury or take excessive interest. He withholds his hand. He, he withholds his hand from doing wrong, and he judges fairly between man and man. He follows my decrees and faithfully keeps my laws. That man is righteous. He will surely live, declares the sovereign Lord. Now, verse 10. Suppose he has a violent son who sheds blood, or does any of these other things. Though the father has done none of them, he eats at the mountain shrines, he defiles his neighbor's wife, he oppresses the poor and the needy, he commits robbery, he does not return what he took in pledge, he looks, he, look, he looks to idols, he does detestable things, he lands, or excuse me, he lends, he lends at usury and takes excessive interest. Will such a man live? He will not. <clears throat> because he has done all these detestable things, he will surely be put to death. And his blood will be on his own head. But, but, but suppose that the son has another son. Okay? Suppose the son has a son who sees all the sins of his father commits and though he sees them, he does not do such things. He does not eat at the mountain shrines or look to the idols uh, of the house of Israel. He does not defile his neighbor's wife. He does not oppress anyone or require a, a pledge for a loan. He does not commit robbery, but gives his food to the hungry and provides clothing for the naked. He withholds his hand from sin. He takes no usury or, usury or excessive interest. He keeps my laws and follows my decrees. He will not die for his father's sin. He will surely live. But the father will die for his own sin. Because he practiced extortion, robbed his brother, and did what was wrong among his people. Verse 20. The soul who sins is the soul who will die. The son will not share in the guilt of the father, nor the father share in the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous man will be credited to him. And the wickedness of the wicked man will be charged against him. <laughs> But if a wicked man turns away from his sins, he has committed and keeps my decrees, and he does what is right, and he does what is just and right, he does what is just and right, he will surely live, he will not die. None of the offenses he has committed will be remembered against him, because, the, because of the righteous things he has done, he will live. Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the sovereign Lord. Brother, am I not pleased when they turn from their sins and they live? But if a righteous man turns from his righteousness and he commits sin and does the same detestable things as the wicked man does, will he live? None of the righteous things that he has done will be remembered. Because of the unfaithfulness, because of his unfaithfulness, he is guilty of, and because of his sins he has committed, he will die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not just. Hear, O Israel, is my way unjust? Is it not your way that is unjust? Therefore, house of Israel, I will judge each according to his ways, declares the sovereign Lord. And he says this, repent, repent, turn from your offenses, then sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourselves of all the offenses that you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. 
Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent and live. Can you see how incredibly seriously God takes our sins? The soul that sins will die. Now, have we all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? Yes. But we're to repent and to live for God. And this, the, in, uh, John, uh, one of John's words, one of the last three, it, the sin is referred to in the singular, not in the plural. In other words, if, you take, if you're living for God, you're doing what's right, you're walking faithfully, you've already been baptized, you're walking faithfully with Christ, and you're out working on a construction project, and you're accidentally hit your thumb and you say a bad word. Okay? You ask God for forgiveness. Is that a singular instant, instance? Yes. Will God forgive you that? Yes. But let's say that you are in Christ, but you're not living like a pagan. You've turned your back on God, and you're just living in sin, and you're living it up like the prodigal son. Before you did, before you did the right thing and repented. Okay? That's, you can't live in sin. If you live in sin continually, you will be lost. Okay? All right, you've got to repent of sin and turn away from sin. Okay, so, the soul that sins will die. If you repent and do what is right, you will live. God calls all of us to repentance. Now, how else do we know how serious that God takes our sins? He sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place. We, not, we, we, we should have been the ones who uh, died on that cross. We should have been the ones who died on the cross. But God sent his son, Jesus, to die in our place. That's how serious God takes our sins. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That everyone who believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now, that's taken out of context a lot, so let's give the rest of the context there. Okay, it's not just belief. If you read earlier in that passage, uh, it, it, Jesus is talking there. He says, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of heaven, or can enter the kingdom of God, unless he is born again. We must be born again. All of us. Guys, listen. I want as many of us to be ready to meet Jesus as possible. And I hope and pray it's every single one of us. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born again. Have you been born again? Some of you have. And some of you haven't. Have you been born again? You must be born both of the water and of the spirit. Uh, Romans 5, 6 says this. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. And then this next one, um, God made him, this is 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him, that is his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who had no sin, Jesus had no sin, to be sin for us. He took our sins upon himself, just like, this is not the best illustration, but let's say you're going on a camping trip, and it's a, a backpacking trip, and it's a long one, all right? So you got your backpack. And, okay, then you got a bunch of people up, and you, you take all of their backpacks on, too, all right? And now you're carrying all those backpacks through the wilderness. That becomes a heavy load, doesn't it? That basically, Jesus, in some ways, that's what he did. He took, he took all of our sins upon himself at the cross. All of our burdens upon himself. He became sin for us so that in him, in him, we might become the righteousness of God. You see, today, spiritually speaking, God sees us only one of two ways. And it's not, it's not, the, it's not Democrat or Republican. It's not American farm. It's not uh, rich poor. It's not black white. It's either we are in Christ or we are outside of Christ. And that's how God sees each and every one of us. We are either in Christ or we are outside of Christ. Now, be extremely careful. Uh, uh, be extremely careful how you think. Be extremely careful how you think. Guard your heart and guard your mind. Okay, Proverbs twenty-three verse seven says this: As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Now, I say this in love, but if you've not given your life to Jesus, believing in Him as Savior and Lord, and if you've not repented, and if you've not been baptized according to the Scriptures, and you if you've not been baptized and you don't have the Holy Spirit, if you've not done those things, I say this in love, but you're lost. You are outside of Christ. 
if you were to die today, you would be separated from God for eternity. That's how serious this is. You are still outside of Christ if you've not obeyed the gospel and made Jesus your Lord and Savior and had your sins washed away and received the gift of the Holy Spirit. However, if you have believed the gospel and Jesus is Lord and Savior and you have repented and you have been baptized and you are walking faithfully, you are living by the Holy Spirit, guess what? Guess what? I don't want to get too far into this because we'll talk about this next week, okay? But you have a new spiritual identity. You have a new spiritual identity if you are in Christ. God and Jesus have done so many wonderful, powerful things for us in Christ and by His blood. It's amazing. It's amazing. I mean, it's, I, mean I, I looked at it. It's at least 75 different good things that Christ has done for us by shedding His blood on the cross and us being able to become a part of His family. So that's next week, sir. Okay, so, all right, so, um, but I say, you, right now, if you've been obedient to the gospel, you have a new spiritual identity in Jesus. You went into the water. Guess what? You went into the water? A sinner. You went into the water? A sinner. But when you came out of that water, you're not just a sinner anymore. So, um, when you were baptized, your sins were washed away, and you received the gift, the precious gift of the Holy Spirit of God. Acts 2.38 says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive what? The gift of the Holy Spirit. For those that have obeyed the gospel and been baptized, Listen to this next part. If you've been baptized, if you've made Jesus your Lord, you've been baptized into Christ, you've lived by the Holy Spirit, listen to this. This is Ephesians chapter 2. This refers to those that are in Christ. As for you, notice the tense. Notice the tense here, okay? As for you, you were, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the way of this world. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of the flesh, not sinful nature, it's flesh in the Greek, okay? And following his desires and thoughts, like the rest we were, by nature, subjects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Remember that at one time, or excuse me, at that time, at that time, you were separated from Christ, without hope, without God in this world. But now, current tense, those that are to the gospel, now in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been brought near through what? Through the blood of Christ. Listen to this, to the core of your heart, to the core of your soul. Therefore, therefore, and this is a song that the kids have learned, and I don't believe it. Yeah, this is a song the kids have learned. We sing it you know, every week. It's our, one of our themes. It's our theme song for the year for um, Pioneer Club. Okay? Therefore, and they always say, if there's any, if therefore is in there, you gotta, so you got to ask yourself, what is it in there for? Because there's usually a command or there's an explanation uh, immediately followed. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is, present tense, a new creation. The old has passed away. It's gone. The new has come. 2 Corinthians 5.17 So for those that are in Christ, have we all sinned before? Yes. The scriptures make that clear. All have sinned and fallen short of God. It, you know, as long as they're old enough to understand what sin is, okay. But for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So, yeah, I mean, have we all sinned? Yes. Should, should we ask God for forgiveness of our sins each day? Yes. That's in the Lord's Prayer, isn't it? Okay? And forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. So that's a good thing as well. However, those that have believed in Jesus and repented of our sins and been baptized into Christ, are we still just sinners? No way. No way. We have a new identity in Jesus Christ. 
And in, in Jesus' name, we all need to realize that. Okay? Though what Jesus did for us on the cross, through, through, what, through what Jesus did for us on the cross, being baptized, we have a completely new identity in Christ, and that's next week's sermon. But uh, that's that's we're getting into next week. So um, I don't want to say more about this next week. Okay, so now there are only two ways. There are only two ways that you are still just a sinner today. Only two ways. One is you've never obeyed the gospel. You've never made Jesus Christ your Lord. You have not been baptized. You refuse to at this point. Okay? You're still living in unrepentant sin. In that way, you are still just a sinner. And the other is this. And I hope this is not the case for any of us. But the other case is this. If you're still just a sinner. It's either you've not obeyed the gospel or you came to Christ long ago. And as uh, Revelation says, you, you have forgotten your first love. You've forgotten your first love. Who is that? Jesus. And you've returned to living in unrepentant sins. See, there's a major difference between repentance of sin and living by the Holy Spirit and living in unrepentant sin. Okay? Major differences there. So, now the Spirit speaking expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, have, now notice what it says here. Notice what it says. Their consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. Now, I'm going to use this. I, okay, so uh, I was doing a youth talk one time, and I was talking about sin in this, this passage, right? I told the guys about this already, so you guys are ahead of the curve. Okay, so, uh, so I heated this iron up really hot, right? And I had this, like, cube steak type of thing. And I got to the point, right in the message, and I was going to take this uh, hot iron, I put it right on, <laughs> I put it right on that steak, right? It, it, it seared it. It sure did. Hey, I thought that it would stay down, but I forgot to spray it ahead of time. So guess what happened? Right? <laughs> I picked it up. Guess what? The hamburger stuck right to it. But still, it made the point. Okay, uh, consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. Don't let that be you. Allow the Word of God and the Holy Spirit to convict you of your sin when you have sinned and repent of it immediately. Don't let sin harden your heart. Don't let sin, um, you know, don't, don't let your conscience be severed or like that, or your conscience seared like a hot iron. Um, okay, so it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known. Let me back that up a little bit. Okay, have, have their consciences seared with, as with a hot iron. It would, it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. This is talking about those, those that were in sin, they came to Jesus, but they returned to sin. So yes, it matters how we live. Yes, God expects us to be faithful. Yes, God expects us to live by His Holy Spirit. Okay? Uh, you can't just return to sin and think you're going to be saved. Living in unrepentant sin. It would have been better for them had they not known the way of righteousness than to have known it and to turn away from it. From a, to turn away from the holy commandment that was passed on to them. That's 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. Now, however, for those that are in Christ, well, let's look. This is what it says, Romans 6, 1. These are ones that are in Christ. What shall we say then? These are those that are in Christ. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning? Shall we go on sinning? So that grace may increase by no means, exclamation point, by no means, don't, don't, don't remain in sin. What does it say? We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the uh, uh, from, raised from the dead through the glory of God the Father, that we may live a what? A new life. A new life. For we know that the old self was crucified with him. That old sinful man has to be crucified. That's a dead man. So that the body of sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin. Be no, no, longer be, no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. In the same way, count yourselves what? Dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. 
Do not offer your parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God. <clears throat> as, those who have been, as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer the parts of your body to Him as what? Instruments of righteousness. No longer, no longer instruments of sin. You're in Christ now. Instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master, because you are not under law, but under grace. Verse 17, but thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching so that, that, uh, in, in which, to which you were entrusted, and you have been set free from sin, and you have become slaves of righteousness. If you are in Christ, you used to be just a sinner, but now in Jesus, by his blood, through baptism, you have a new identity. And you're expected to live by the Holy Spirit of God. Now, I gave this as an illustration a couple weeks ago. We were, uh, I'll go through a personal illustration here in a second. Okay, so, uh, we were going through, the topic was confession. The topic was confession. So, um, one of our main texts was 2 Samuel chapter 11. Okay, so this is David and Bathsheba. So, David, David was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was a king. He should have been out to war uh, with his troops, leading his army. Okay, he's at the wrong place at the wrong time. You want to keep from slipping? Don't go where it's slippery. Okay, all right. So uh, David was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He began to rationalize his sin as king. He should have been in the army. Now he he was at the palace. He was, he saw Bathsheba taking a bath. He sent for Bathsheba. Now notice how he's rationalizing his sin. It's one step after another after another. He's rationalizing. Never rationalize a sin, you lose every time. Okay? So he, he's in the wrong place, he's at the palace, he sees Bathsheba taking a bath, he sent for Bathsheba, she came to the palace, he slept, uh, uh, she, he slept with her, uh, he, plotted, he plotted to send uh, uh, Bathsheba's husband, he plotted against Bathsheba, Bathsheba's husband, he tried to get Uriah, her husband, to stay at home, he brought him back from the battle, tried to get Uriah to sleep with her, However, he was too good of a soldier to do that. Uh, David made him drunk and tried to get him drunk and go home and, and to be with his wife. But Uriah did not go home. So David plotted even more. With, with some of his army uh, to put Uriah at the head and then have the troops withdraw. And then Uriah was killed in battle. Uriah died. He was essentially murdered. Now, here's what I want to share with you. Let's assume over here, I'm just using this as an illustration, okay? But let's say that this is a man or a woman of God over here. And this represents being within the will of God and being obedient to God, okay? All right? So you're over here, you're walking with God, you're doing what God wants you to do, okay? But all of a sudden, you say, well, I'm just a sinner. It's just the sin nature. You know, I'm going to sin anyway. Wouldn't God understand? You see how that could lead you to hell. And all of a sudden, most men of God don't jump from here, and then this other side would represent being completely lost, not caring about God whatsoever. Their conscience has been seared, they're completely lost, and they're leading other people down the wrong path. Okay? Most, most, most men and women of God do not go from there to here in one step. It's a gradual, slow step process of rationalizing the sin. Don't do that. We are called to be led by the Holy Spirit of God. So, when you're over here, you're like, okay, God's called me to live by His Holy Spirit. Okay? I need to walk with God. I need to pray and spend time with the Lord. Holy Spirit, lead me. God, lead me. Help me. Walk with you. Okay? I'm struggling in this area. Oh, i got to put a guard up. i got to guard my heart and guard my mind in that area. Oh, I hit my hand with a hammer. Ah, I said something I shouldn't have said. What do you do? Going down the road of sin? No. Lord, forgive me. Please. I repent. I was wrong. I want to be back in step with your Holy Spirit. It does say, keep in step with the Holy Spirit of God. <coughs> Even theologians make excuses for their sins. And honestly, the sin nature is one of the biggest excuses that's not true. And actually even made it into some of the scriptures. You won't find it in the original brief. You will find it. it's one of the, it's one of the ways where the NIV is wrong. Okay, anyway. 
Okay, so sadly you can see David rationalized the sin. Don't, don't rationalize the sin. Um, he had at least 13 or 14 chances to repent and return to God. He had many, many different chances to return to God. Okay. Okay, so now here's the thing. God sent the prophet Nathan to David to rebuke him. Okay? God sent the prophet Nathan to David to rebuke him. And there were four judgments from God that were declared, declared against David's sin. David and his sin. Okay? And this is what he said. Uh, these, are the, these are the judgments. The sword would never depart from his house. Out of his own household, calamity would come upon him. God would take away the very wives, his very wives, and give them to someone who was close to him, and he would lie with them in broad daylight. And it wasn't till that point that David finally repented. David finally repented. He's like, I have sinned. I have sinned against God. Okay? Now, after the third judgment, that's when David repents. Then there's the fourth judgment. The son that would be born to him would die as well. In Jesus' name, realize that in Christ, you are not just a sinner anymore. Should you be humble? Yes. Should you repent of your sins if you hit your hand with a hammer? Yes. But should you get back in step and live by the Holy Spirit of God? Absolutely. Live by the Holy Spirit. Be as faithful to God as you can be. Okay? Never rationalize a sin. You lose every time. Realize that you are now a new creature, a new creation in Christ. You are an ambassador for Christ. Your sins have been washed away. Believe that, but don't just believe it. Think it. Now, why think it? Why think it? Ralph Waldo Emerson said this. If you sow a thought, what do you reap? If you sow a thought, what do you reap? An action. If you sow an action, what do you reap? A habit. You sow a habit, you reap a character. If you sow a character, you reap an eternity. Our destiny is tied directly to our thoughts. And so in Jesus' name, stop thinking, I'm just a sinner. Because here's the thing. If that's the case, one of two things has happened. You either have been taught incorrectly, that's one, or the other is, you're just trying to make excuses for your sins. It's just one of those two. It's either you've been taught incorrectly, or you're still trying to make excuses for your sinful behavior now. We're not to live in sin any longer. We're to live by the Holy Spirit. If you are outside of Christ, if you are outside of Christ, do not remain in your sins. And you say, well, I'm a good guy. I'm a nice guy. I, you know, I make good grades. I'm, I'm a good employee. I blah, 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 blah. None of that matters. You're not good enough. No one's good enough. Only Jesus is good enough. We have to have the blood of Christ applied apply to us, all of us. Okay? You say, well, I'm not that far lost. Again, you're not, you're not good enough. Okay? All of us must give our lives to Christ. If you are in Christ, realize that you are a new creation. Think that way. Live that way. Never return to your sins. Live by the Holy Spirit of God. Romans 8.13 says this. Now please listen to this. Romans 8.13. For, for if you live according to the flesh, and that's the Greek. It's not simple nature in the Greek. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. And you say, well, that's, you know, we mentioned Ezekiel, uh, but you know, that's Old Testament. Well, this is New Testament. <laughs> okay? For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit... The Holy Spirit, if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because, now note this next part, it's not just anybody that claims to be a Christian is a Christian. If you're not a, there's a lot of people out there right now. They're teaching things that are leading all kinds of people to hell. I mean, sad, sad, but it's true. They're teaching a completely different gospel altogether. It's not the, it's not the true gospel. Okay? Um, so, the thing is, uh, we are to be led by the Spirit. Now, here's the thing. Um, you say, well, I became a Christian long ago, but are you living by the Spirit of God? Are you keeping in step with the Holy Spirit? Because it says, notice this. I'm going to read it again. 
For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because, note this, those that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Not just anyone who says it. Not just anyone who claims it. It's, have you been obedient to the gospel, and are you being led by the Holy Spirit? Those, according to this, are the sons of God. So here's the thing. <clears throat> Ask yourself this. Are you living in unconfessed sin? Have you obeyed the gospel? Have you made Jesus Lord of your life? Have you been baptized? Have your sin washed away and receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit? And if you are in Christ, are you letting the Holy Spirit lead you each day, each moment? Because if you do, that's who the real people of God are, according to Scripture. Okay, this morning, if you're living by the Holy Spirit, continue to live by the Holy Spirit. But if you're living by the flesh, it's time to repent and have Jesus wash your sins away. And have Jesus give you, what's it say, a new heart. Get a new heart. You'll be a new creation and a new spiritual identity. This morning, if you have a decision to make, please come forward as we sing our invitation. down to that. Are we washed in the blood of the Lamb? God loves you. We love you. Don't delay if you know what you need to do. Okay? Give your life to Jesus. Uh, and live for him. I'm going to ask uh, Matt if you would have a closing prayer. Father in heaven, you are so holy. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that Jesus was able to take our sin. And those of us that have accepted Christ, we do not make excuses for little things that happen in our lives to say that we are still sinners, to say that the devil still has control because we've beaten the devil. Jesus proved that. We love him. There are people walking around now holding on to things, <coughs> holding on to sins that we've already forgiven. Please, I pray we don't hold on to the sins of our neighbor, the sins of friends or family, because you've given us a new body, a new heart. Our spirit is your spirit. This week, I pray, Lord, that you would allow us to repent of those little things as well as the big things. Remember that you are God. You are holy. You are the reason why we are here. We call on you for our salvation. Relieve us of our stress and our pain. Thank you for this message today. I hope that it's hitting us all in our hearts. For so many of us just we make excuses. No more excuses. <clears throat> I pray that your spirit lifts us up, keeps us up, and keeps us safe this week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Love you guys very much. God loves you. We love you. Have a great week, okay? Take care, y'all.